This is IAQ Radio, Indoor Air Quality Radio, the voice of the indoor air quality industry, with your host, Radio Joe Hughes, and the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. And now, Radio Joe Hughes. Good day and welcome to IAQ Radio Plus, episode 655. This week is the first in our series we're calling The Life and Times of IEQ founding fathers, and I, I should probably add mothers as well, because I'm sure there's a few founding mothers. Before we get started with our interview with Dr. J. David Miller, we want to thank our sponsors. Our marquee sponsor is Instascope at instascope.co. Our association sponsors are the American Industrial Hygiene Association, AIHA, Org, the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists, ACGIH.org, the Cleaning Industry Research Institute, CIRIScience.org, the Indoor Air Quality Association, IAQA.org, the Institute for Inspection, Cleaning, and Restoration Certification, IICRC.org. Industry sponsors are AEML Laboratories. AEMLINC.com, Particles Plus, ParticlesPlus.com, TSI Inc., TSI.com, Sunbelt Rentals, SunbeltRentals.com, April Air, April AIRE.com, Healthy Indoors Magazine, HealthyIndoors.com. And now you can win a cool prize. It's time for the IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Be the first to correctly answer. Simply email your answer to czlotnick at cs.com. Or if listening live, just text your answer from your computer. And now, here's the Z-Man. Hello, everyone. Congratulations go out to Michael McGinnis, RK Occupational and Environmental Analysis, Inc., in Phillipsburg, New Jersey, who was first to identify Memnoniella as the genus of mold historically considered to be closely related to the genus Stachybotrys charterum because the spores are produced in slimy heads rather than in dry ones. The IQ radio trivia question for today, February 25, 2022, has been sponsored by TSI Inc., an industry leader in precision instrumentation for the monitoring of indoor air. Learn how to expand your IEQ investigations at TSI.com. Here's today's IEQ Radio Trivia question. Name what, by the early 1990s, had become the top complaint of occupants in non-industrial workplaces? Back to you, Joe. Okay, Dr. J. David Miller is a distinguished research professor at Carleton University in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. He's published over 350 papers and has co-written 10 books on public health aspects of exposure to fungi and uh, has several patents as well. He served on many national and international committees on mold and dampness in the built environment, including the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology Committee that produced the practice parameters for environmental allergens. He was the chief editor of the American Industrial Hygiene Association's Green Book and the Field Guide that lay out guidelines for addressing mold and dampness in public buildings. And in 2021, he received the inaugural Phil R. Moray Award from the ACGIH for contributions to bioaerosol guidance. Welcome back, Dr. Miller. Thank you, uh, Joe. This is all a bit of a surprise, but you know, we'll see how it goes. Uh, well, it's great to have you. We've had you several times before. You know, and I, I, I always like to mention it's not just you're not just a mold fungi guy. You've, you've done a lot on indoor air quality, indoor environmental quality in general, including one that I think is a lot overlooked. And we did a nice show on it, and that's dust mites. Um, let's talk, talk a little bit about your early career. How did you get started in the indoor environmental quality world? Yeah, so <clears throat> I mean, as a scientist, my scientific interest is is um, is that fungi um, compete, so they make poisons. Some of them are poisonous to us, which we call mycotoxins. They make allergens, of course, um, but they also make compounds that kill other fungi that kill insects that kill nematodes anybody that competes they they uh, produce uh, you know compounds that can favor their 
So that's what I've always been curious about. And, uh, and so when I was hired out of my postdocs, I, for Agriculture Canada, it was because of the need to work on the toxins, the ones that occur in grain. Um, and, uh, and so the, the, actual, the answer to the question is that in the early 80s, many uh, governments, uh, many companies and others were being sued for installing urea formaldehyde foam insulation, um, in, especially in buildings that, uh, you know, were, had wood frame walls. And, and so <clears throat> I was, um, as I always say, voluntold by my employer to start working on that. Um, uh, and so I did. So that's how I personally got started into really trying to understand, well, why would people complain in their houses if, you know, from exposures to, you know, what basically everything that is there. And I remember you, you talked about early in your academic career, you went over to England and you were exposed to a course, I believe it was on moisture and, and how moisture affected materials, but maybe you could tell yeah, us. So, so I, again, I've given you some sense of what motivates me scientifically, but, but the, um, uh, in the course of doing my higher degrees, I wanted to go to the University of Portsmouth in the south of England um, because there was the best expert in the world in an area I was really interested in was a professor there. And, um, and so they, uh, it worked out that I would come and take a course uh, degree while learning you know, what I wanted to learn from this big deal guy. And, uh, and the degree was about biodeterioration and frankly, something that I hadn't thought about at all in the new world because it's cold, we, everything's new. Whereas of course you go to the UK and there's buildings that are many centuries old. So they have, and it's warmer and wetter there than most parts of the US and Canada. So um, organisms degrading buildings, degrading food, still true, other things are much more of a problem in these, in uh, in uh, sort of cool rainy areas rather than what I was used to in Eastern Canada. And um, so I had to take a whole bunch of really uh, courses that weren't immediately relevant to my interest uh, in, in wood decay, water relations, uh, the engineering physics of how water moved from inside to outside, the organisms involved, um, you know, a whole series of sort of modules about, about things that later became very important in, uh, in when I was uh, voluntold to work on the built environment. I think we have a photo of you back in those days here. Let's see. This would be around <laughs> the 1980s. <laughs> Maybe you could tell us a little more once we get it up here. Yeah, well, that was then. This is now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so that uh, was taken shortly after I came to Ottawa, which was um, in 1982, uh, to join Agriculture Canada. And uh, that's I was 28, I guess, when that was taken. And when you were at Agriculture Canada, is that also where you, you did a lot of work on mycotoxins? And, yes, and how that's why I was food? hired. And, and because... Um, when the government uh, faced with this problem of people complaining about their housing conditions that were they associated with this insulation material, um, they looked around to see where the expertise that might lie to um, begin seriously researching that for a big litigation. And, and in, in a way, the mirror happened in the United States because the people who were first brought on from a, almost from a, a government perspective were at, at NIOSH. Uh, and they had a group that does and did still wor uh, you know, work on, um, on agricultural exposures to fungi and you know, fungal issues in terms of ventilation exposure. So that that was pretty consistent. That happened in the UK as well, that basically 
from a fungal side, the people that were first uh, recruited to work on this problem were people who worked in agriculture. Um, and I mean, the other related thing is that when you work on fungal toxins, a huge piece of it is that you have very big and expensive analytical labs. So if you're going to go in and, you know, measure poisons in food or see what they do to, you know, in terms of human and animal health, you need a really big analytical horsepower and uh, which I am. Um, and so, um, so uh, that allowed when I uh, was given the task um, where we went in and looked really carefully at about 60 homes in different parts of Eastern Canada that uh, had been associated with these urethromaldehyde foam insulation complaints. Uh, and basically I made the decision that I would measure everything that I could think of because it, from my perspective, and maybe this is a relevant point, I had no biases. I hadn't been part of any indoor air quality community, you know, but I was asked, okay, well, why are people complaining? So we literally measured everything you could imagine, even in by today's standards, including fungal volatiles. Um, um, of course, the fungi themselves, the air change rates, the, the formaldehyde in the air gases, uh, basically literally everything so that we could see why people uh, complained. And what I always say about that study, the published paper is, is still cited quite a bit, is that, is that um, we went in there, I think, with the idea, or people did, that there's one thing that's causing the problems. But what we found, of course, was there were many things, in, including as it happened, mold and dampness, uh, but, you know, also, you know, formaldehyde was there and moisture problems and, and so on and so forth. And how prevalent were these problems? And what percentage of the homes did you find problems? Well, we targeted homes that that were people complained about. So it was was it was deliberate for that um, in terms of people complaining in, in, in New England, there were a lot of homes, especially Massachusetts, New York, uh, not just across Canada. Um, the um, the uh, a lot of people complained of very high prevalence. And the reason was that, that the products emitted uh, what today would be unlawful concentrations of formaldehyde in the building. So, of course, people noticed and then there were long litigations about, well, that's not dangerous. That, of course, was before formaldehyde was declared a, a known human carcinogen. Uh, you know, so, you know, there were arguments about all that. So people got digressed, uh, worrying about, uh, you know, a particular picture because that's what people associated their symptoms with because, of course, they could smell it. I see. And... Uh... From there, you, you continued to do a lot of research. And I know the Canadians early on, the Canada Mortgage, yeah. CMHC, it was a Canada Mortgage Housing Corporation, Corporation and others, yeah. did a lot of research in residential buildings and and I, I would assume some commercial buildings as well on indoor air quality. Um, did that start about the same time? Yes, but it, it didn't actually start at CMHC. It started at Health Canada. Um, because it had been so, tr I think because it was so traumatic, what had happened with this this problem with UFI, that decisions were made um, uh, to have a look at dampness, mold, dampness, um, mold, and he health. Um, just a little bit after that, so say by 1986, 87, in that period. Uh, and I was involved in that, and 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 it's a little bit important to set some context. So, long-range uh, transport of air pollution was a big thing in the '80s. You may distantly remember how bad it was I do. in this yes. uh, in in this neck of the woods and where you live, in the Ohio Valley and so on down there. Absolutely, um, for obvious reasons. So, um, the uh, Canadian government had set up a big study of the health of children in 30 communities across Canada. 
Um, and Harvard had a program in six communities, mostly in the Northeast of the US, in the highly affected areas. Um, and of interest, both programs realizing that the indoor environment and people were more and more starting to complain about dampness and other issues because they tighten, people tightened their homes up, um, uh, made the decision to go in and, and look at those uh, children and their um, whichever parent uh, responded uh, with a survey instrument that asked about mold and dampness and water and respiratory health. And, um, and that, that decision was made uh, um, in the 86, 87 period. And, and that resulted in, in one of the two really important papers that set all this in motion. Uh, and, and it was uh, the senior author was uh, still a, a colleague, Bob Dales, um, or one of the senior authors. Um, and what they found was that uh, able to correct for the outdoor air pollution, that if you lived in a home with more reports of mold and dampness, the children were more likely to uh, um, be allergic, to have asthma, and also more likely to be, um, have more upper respiratory disease. And, and the study was so big, there were 15,000 children and 18,000 adults in the study, mm -hmm. that they were able to see um, that there was a dose response. In other words, when people reported more mold, um, they reported more symptoms. And exactly at the same time, using the same strategy, the Harvard Six City Studies, Jack Spengler, um, did exactly the same thing in the six cities, very well studied communities. And, um, and they found um, a similar signal, um, uh, namely that if you, if the kids in the six Northeast cities lived or lived in a home with more dampness, they were more likely to be allergic. So not two studies, one with 4,600 children and one with 15,000 children, reported these risks in 1989 and 1991. Um, and and the, the, the critical thing about those two studies, um, we could look at them today and say, well, ho hum, everybody shows that. But at the time, no one believed it was, it was considered completely insane um, that this could happen. There was no known mechanism for it. People, uh, you know, said you guys don't know what you're doing at Harvard and Health Canada. Uh, but that's basically then led to big investments by Health Canada, by Canada Mortgage and Housing, by the, our Department of Energy, basically, to start to look more carefully at, at this, um, you know, whether this was right or not. And then... What, I, what I'd like to talk about more as we go through the show is how you and others help to change, you know, make the big change and get people to recognize that these were significant issues that needed to be addressed through guidance and standards and guidelines and so forth. And um, but before we do, I want to kind of round out your history a little bit. We, we're up into the you know 90s now, and, and I want to kind of give people an idea. Where did you go from there? Yeah, well, I was at Agriculture Canada until 19, the end of 19, well, until 1990, the end of 1998. Uh, and then I moved half a kilometer <laughs> across the, <laughs> the canal and, and came to Carleton University for a, um, a research chair, um, which provided... As I had at Agriculture Canada, I do want to emphasize the enormous public, uh, private, public and private academic support I've received, and of course, hundreds of students and colleagues and postdocs and so on to do this work. Um, uh, so it was it was allowed me when I moved. Uh, you know, firstly, no one told me what to do, <laughs> and secondly. Uh, um, uh, secondly, it allowed me to really focus, as one of the things I've done here, on trying to answer the question, why 
did we see those signals, you know, 15, 16, 17, 20 years before? And we did come to an answer to that after spending, you know, $20 million or something ridiculous. <laughs> uh, but but it, it interests me that that something that we now know is is no one argues about that mold and dampness in buildings are, is bad for you, or at least I don't know. <laughs> it was considered the most crazy thing um, that um, that uh, you know one could imagine. But but our position, and certainly mine, was if it was true. So let's just look at that. And given that, you know, then about probably 20% of homes in the United States and Canada had moisture problems okay. as an underestimate, probably, let's just say material moisture problems. If it was true, that was a very bad thing. So, so you have to weigh, I think our policymakers and funders said, okay, if it's true, then maybe we should try to really understand it and get to the bottom of it. And, you know, that uh, it makes me think back to another interview we did with you where you compared the, you know, the, the hesitance within public health and others to, um, you know, to agree that uh, dampness and moisture were causing problems to the hesitance when dust mites were first. Yes determined to be a, a, this type of issue. That's correct. And, and when I was a student in England, that debate was, was um, you know, was raging. In, in fact, I recall going to London for a scientific meeting and, you know, the guys, the Dutch guy and the English guy um, who were, you know, providing evidence for this, they, people laughed out loud in the room, the physicians. It made no sense. Um, and, you know, it took, it took about 20, it took the same length of time for dust mites, something, again, it causes most of the asthma in the United States and Canada. It took about the same amount of time, 20 years, to bring consensus, especially to the medical community, as it did for fungi. So, you know, all new things, we respond with anger, denial, and then ultimately acceptance if there's evidence. And that has been your calling for many years is to help provide that evidence, the why. Um, and and you've, you've done a lot of that over the years. Let me put up a photo real quick. I, I just think it's a beautiful shot of, uh, of, the, call, of the university, I should say. John? There we so go. That, that's where I'm privileged to work. There's a few additional buildings since they build buildings like crazy. <laughs> but, but yeah, so I live here and uh, just down the river that you can see at the bottom where the train uh, track is, part of our LRT system. Uh, and uh, I just live a few a few miles just down on a canoe down that, <laughs> mm -hmm. down that uh, river and... Uh, and as I said, I moved from where the green space is on the right uh, in 1997, 98, in that period, um, to uh, to the university here. You know, we were talking about dust mites and mold, and I'm, you know, you, you said that dust mites were the the number one cause for asthma, and I don't remember. You can straighten me out in on the United that. States and Canada. That's correct. Okay, why is it? We rarely hear anything about dust mites, and we always see mold, mold, mold. Well, one thing you know the answer is you can't see the dust mites. <laughs> um, but what is really, it's sort of like mold in a way, too, that the um, uh, first house dust mites were measured in Canadian and American homes in 1969 and 1970, and they were rare. And now you could not find a home. Certainly not in any of the coasts or the south, southeast that didn't have dust mites in it. So in, in what seems like an astonishingly short time to many of us in this virtual room, we've gone from no dust mites to dust mites causing a big percentage of the asthma that, 
that we have to, uh, you know, that affects people's lives that, you know, has a big healthcare cost attached to it. It's, it's, it's just still kind of fascinating to me that we've got an entire industry built around mold inspections and mold right. sampling. And none of those people or very few ever even mentioned dust mites. In yeah. Their- and, and that is a surprise because the, certainly the clinical practice parameter on dust, dust mites from the quad AI, I mean, it's, and as well as, uh, uh, you know, which, uh, in that paper, it, it has some pretty useful things that would, you know, uh, help people, perhaps address complaints. I very often hear from consultant, you know, colleagues in the US, they've been investigating the crap out of a building, people believe it's a mold problem. And, and you know, sometimes this happens in offices too. And, and it turns out pro- that there's a, probably an excess burden of fine dust, which means there's a shitload of house dust mites mm-hmm. in there. And, you know, it's, an ex- it's a potent allergen, which is one reason why we see uh, so much uh, allergy to an asthma to it. Um, and, and of course, you can, as I said, see house dust mites. Um, you know, I just, you know, that gets to the need to have a clean space with, you know, least amount of fine particles. Um, Which is, I think, one of the main outcomes of all the research done over the years, I think there's only a few things, and we'll, we'll talk about this in the second half, that we can point to that really work. And and one is we've got to get people to take better care of their environment. Yeah, I think that's, that's true. I mean, you can engineer the best building in the world. Uh, you can for the climate, for the mechanical, the heating, cooling, and all that kind of stuff. But if people don't run the building appropriately and respond, if there's a water incursion or you know other ch- or bring some insane number of plants in the house or something, including a bunch of dope plants, or, um, <laughs> then you're going to have problems there, and that's why. A lot of, especially our effort in Canada uh, with CMHC and Health Canada um, and the provinces has been to provide pretty good educational materials um, because we need those guys um, to, uh, you know, every occupant to, you know, at least be able to find out good quality information that makes sense and it's written at the right level um, and it's useful. Um, and uh, make it accessible. The EPA does this pretty well as, as well. Some states do. California does a, a notable example. So you need good information product, and you need to get people to pay attention to it. And, you know, how successful you are is how successful you are. So a lot of our my thread as well, so I mentioned the thread of measuring everything. So in all of the studies that we've done, to one that was published a few weeks ago. Um, I make sure that we measure everything because of that formative experience that people blamed everything but what was causing the problem because mm. they could sense it. A second thing is, is um, uh, for example, once mold was, uh, was you know, flagged as a problem in the epidemiology studies, uh, the second big study, we I made the decision that we would measure house dust mites, which was a bit of a challenge then, um, uh, house dust mite allergen, which was a real challenge then, it's easy now, um, um, endotoxin, um, pretty much many of the things we'd want to measure today, except it costs more. And, and the reason I wanted to do that is that they're important too, as I've explained, but I wanted to know um, what happens if you mixed all of them together? Does that make anything worse? And at least for the major contaminants, the answer is no, uh, that each one of them is potent in and of, them, in and of themselves, except the endotoxin. So if there's more endotoxin in your house, along with house dust mites or mold or whatever the allergen is that's bothering you, dog, cat, then you are more likely to have symptoms, more likely to become allergic. 
and um, um, uh, and it takes a lower dose of allergen to give you symptoms. So another, it goes back to my bias about not believing, if you like, what people, you know, what people said, but trying to really take it apart so we could put it back together in a sensible way. But but again, I want to emphasize the immense amount of talent and expertise that had to be brought to bear uh, to, you know, to do all of that. Um, and I'll, I'll say one more thing because I, I've made the point about the, you know, second, the big studies, uh, the, sec the studies after the 91 study. Um, I also wanted to make sure, uh, unfortunately this, you know, there were others who shared this bias that we were also really looking carefully at the engineering of the houses we were studying, as well as the public buildings. So I haven't talked about that, but we did a lot of that as well, government buildings. And, um, and, and part of my reason for wanting that is that I didn't want to get to the end and say, oh my God, there's a terrible problem, but we don't know what to tell you. You know, so, so part of the bias was to make sure, unlike, many other studies, certainly in Europe, where they weren't bringing the big engineering piece into the into the story so that we could get to the end and say, here's what we need to change uh, to help, uh, you know, uh, fix this. I think that's an, a, an excellent point, and one we'll come back to in the second half of our interview here. We're talking with Dr. J. David Miller. I, I like to think of this as... Um, it's hard to run away from evidence is kind of the, the key point that keeps coming out. How do you affect change? I remember talking to you and you said, it's hard to run away from evidence. And we've been talking about evidence for the first half hour here. That's and we're right. going to talk more in the second. All right, let's stop and thank our sponsors. And we'll be right back with Dr. Miller. Our marquee sponsor, Instascope. More jobs done faster with the future of IAQ assessment technology. Unlimited samples, instant results, and cloud-based data at instascope.co. Association sponsors are AIHA, Healthy Workplaces, A Healthier World, AIHA.org, ACGIH, Advancing Careers of Professionals in Environmental Health, Industrial Hygiene, and Safety, Interested in Defining Their Science, ACGIH.org, The Cleaning Industry Research Institute, See More Deeply Through Science and Research, CIRI Science. Dot org. The Indoor Air Quality Association, IAQA.org. The IICRC, a nonprofit standards development and certifying body for the cleaning and restoration industry, IICRC.org. Industry sponsors are AEML Laboratories, free shipping, great pricing, same day results with no rush fee, AEMLINC.com. Particles Plus. Feature-rich particle counters and air quality instrumentation. Count on us, ParticlesPlus.com. TSI Inc., an industry leader in precision instrumentation for monitoring indoor air. Learn how to expand your IAQ investigations, TSI.com. Sunbelt Rentals, availability, reliability, and ease for all your IAQ and restoration needs at sunbeltrentals.com. April Air, healthy air, healthy home, April, A-I-R-E dot com. And Healthy Indoors Magazine, a free online magazine for industry professionals and consumers, healthyindoors.com. Okay, um, our condolences go out to Radio Joe Hughes, who lost his mother, Marjorie A. Hughes, at age 85 on February 16th, 2022, Joe. We, uh, we mourn your mom and we're very sorry uh, for your loss. And uh, there were a lot of people at that funeral and uh, the deacon did do a very, very nice job. Thank you.
Dominic Nicolella, founder of John Don and one of the most beloved people in the cleaning and restoration industry, passed away peacefully, surrounded by his family on Thursday, February 17th, after a battle with COVID-19 and double pneumonia. He was 86 years young. He was born on April 29, 1935, to the late Rose and Angelo Palella. He was preceded in death by a sister and a grandson. He survived by his loving wife of 58 years, Judy, six children, his grandfather to six uh, grandchildren, and great-grandfather to four grandchildren. Nick Palella didn't have just a few friends. He had thousands of them. If you ever attended a trade show or event or visited John Don, especially during a customer appreciation day, he was there to greet you, most likely feed you uh, as well. He was an expert at the grill and all things related to uh, friendship and hospitality. He received the Ralph Bloss Humanitarian Award in 2017 in recognition of his kindness, which is known throughout the industry. These are some Nickisms. For those of you who knew and loved him, uh, chances are you've heard him say these words and heard him say them uh, more than once. Work hard, play hard. It's about life and balance. People will want to do for your company because of how they feel about being part of it. It's about company culture. Make sure you ring the bell in the morning when you wake up. That's about responsibility. A presentation without a demonstration is simply a conversation. Uh, Talked about Nick's work ethic and professional salesmanship. Don't be afraid to say, I love you. Uh, he appreciated others. Service to the customer is above all else and really was the purpose of his business. A handshake is more powerful than a signature. It's kind of all about integrity. And finally, make friends out of the people you do business with. One of the last things Nick said, according to those close to him, was I'm going to miss one blank party. If there is one thing everyone knew him would agree on this, it's that Nick wants everyone to enjoy every party coming their way. He'll be there with you in spirit. Nick Polella was uh, geez, uh, a, a one of a kind. I've never went anyone even remotely like him. Nick Polella, rest in peace. Back to you, Joe. All right. Thank you, Cliff. Dr. Miller, let's get back. I want to Talk a little bit about um, when we talked, you said it's not about me. It's about the journey. Um, who are some of the people that influenced you early in your career? And um, tell us a little bit about them. Well, of course, I mean, when you go to university for some ungodly time, the people who taught you are really important, you know, provided investment by Canada, by my home province, by academic scholarships and others to teach me what I needed to know to do the work that I was asked to, to do, uh, both on fungal toxins and, and of course, the, the built environment stuff. Um, I, I did emphasize the really importance of, of very large public support um, and academic support and private support for the type of work that I've been involved with, because all of this stuff costs like hell. And, um, and, and, and the goal would be, how do we better build buildings? How do we better um, um, inform occupants and owners? Um, uh, how do we form uh, long-term code development and so on to, you know, to basically improve the housing stock. Um, so, I mean, if I started naming names, it would be incomplete, but, but I, I would single out a few people. So in, in Canada, um, the two uh, physicians I've worked a lot with, uh, Bob Dales uh, and Tom Cavessi, uh, on both the housing and health studies, but also on on related issues to do with the health issues of kids. Um, you know, the engineers that have been pivotal, it it's includes uh, Jim White, um, uh, Don Fugler, Ken Ray, Mark Lawton, um, um, people that were both in government and the private sector um, who helped power the big studies that I'm talking about and make them sensible. Um, Lots of 
policy people had to make these choices. So you can imagine there's a community there. In the United States, um, you know, again, there are many people who, who started to, if you like, get with the program. So one person who I think is really important and probably under remembered or underappreciated is the late Ken Dillon, who was a professor at the University of Alabama um, and very active in the American Industrial Hygiene Association. And he led the development of the first um, uh, edition of the AIHA field guide. In other words, trying to codify methods for looking at um, microbiological things in building. And, you know, frankly, this was in 1996. He and others, including me, took a lot of shit for that because, of course, <laughs> mold wasn't a problem, right? Yeah. Um, but we felt that if people were going to, uh, industrial hygienists were going to make measurements, they should, you know, should try to do so according to uh, good advice. And um, um, I also would single out Laura Kolb at the EPA, who um, had her big part of the indoor air division for a long time, um, you know, was interested in the opinions of the late Phil Morey and Terry Brennan, who I, you, you had on your show some a month or so ago, uh, six weeks ago. Um, and another person I would single out who is, who is, um, who, is uh, who also took a lot of shit, I have to say, uh, is Dr. Jay Portnoy, the, the leading academic allergist, really, I think, one of them in the world, um, who started to talk more seriously about the importance of mold um, in non-industrial workplaces and homes, um, who, um, who, yeah, took shit because the allergy community was nearly the last community to accept that mold was a relevant health factor. Um, so there were a lot of people who, who were, and Phil Mori, of course, who were critical to, um, um, as well as some important um, researchers in Europe, who were critical to um, adding evidence, to promoting good dialogue, and to forming reasonable public policy positions. And I, you know, when, when we talked about uh, affecting change, it, you just kind of summarized it, um, how you went about trying to help affect change. And a lot of it was developing the evidence yes. that people could stand on to develop these guidance documents, standards, right. et cetera. Can you talk a little more about that? Well, I think the really best example is that um, the quad AI material, which had, you know, really amazing, I did spend eight years of my life meeting at eight o'clock Eastern time in the evening, every other Wednesday for eight months <laughs> a year, which was not fun. <laughs> Except, I mean, it was fun because the work was great and a great group of uh, folks, um, you know, on furry pets, on rodents, on cockroaches, on house dust mites, and the house dust mite parameter is, is really good. And Part of what I tried to achieve is to make sure it reflected climates in my country and not just, uh, you know, below the 49th parallel kind of thing. And um, the last community was the allergy community. Um, and that's because if we go right back to 1991, no matter how many other studies were done worldwide, the how would you explain that you're more likely to be allergic, not just to mold, but do everything if you live in a moldy building. And how would you explain that you are more likely to have more colds and flu? How would you explain that? Um, and that did take a long time. Uh, so we have a good answer for that now. And as that answer emerged, which was around 2015, clearly emerged, 16, um, then the medical community was much more prepared to accept that, you know, what public health and industrial hygienists have been saying in some cases for a couple of decades. So, so that, you know, just like house dust mites, you know, firstly, you got epidemiology. There was a Dutch guy called Speaksma and a Japanese researcher and oddly uh, another Japanese researcher based in Hawaii um, who said that, you know, 
it looked like house dust mites cause asthma. So that was in the 50s, 60s, um, into the early 70s. Um, and then somebody said, okay, maybe it does. So then somebody had to identify the principal allergen of house dust mites. Uh, and then they had to measure uh, antibodies in uh, people that people believed were individuals that people believed were allergic to house dust mites house dust mites, and if they had antibodies, that's pretty solid proof. And then you add to measure the um, allergen in the environment. All of those steps were required before there was a, a big sea change about house dust mites, which took from, it took 20 years. So, so the fungal journey uh, at the end was the same, was really sort of epidemiology, if you like, and no matter how well done, there was a journey there. Um, and then secondly, how would you explain this unusual medical um, outcome, which is allergy to nearly everything if you've been in a uh, worked or lived in a moldy building uh, and increased risk of up, upper respiratory disease. And we have a good understanding of that now. And can you go into a little more detail on, on what that understanding is? The, you know, what? Uh... Yeah, so, I mean... Outdoor air is full of fungi. I mean, in the, I mean, anyone who's got hay fever to fungi knows that. Um, um, uh, not the pollen, but so there's basically the way you look at it is that every leaf you have ever seen in your life in the growing season is covered with fungi. 100%. And there's a reason for that. In fact, the trees and plants feed that space so that some fungi will grow there because it helps to keep disease fungi away. Um, and those fungi are, there's enormous numbers of them in the air at some times of the year. And a lot of people are, about 8% of Americans are allergic to them. Um, but there's a fairly small number of genera. So one of the big bears, especially in the medical community was, well, my goodness, there's biblical numbers of fungi in outdoor air from the phyloplane fungi, the leaf fungi, and then mushroom fungi uh, on into the fall when you see mushrooms and bracket fungi and so on. So people said, how could it be that much lower exposures to fungi that occur in buildings um, um, produce this completely different effect? Uh, and there were a lot of arguments about that, but the, the most, there are, there are really three important reasons. One of them is that the fungi that mostly grow in buildings are different um, genetically and where they fit in the organization of fungi, the family tree, if you like. And they make a, a form of a polysaccharide, beta-1,3-D glucan, that is uh, um, potent and it turns on an inflammatory receptor in your lungs. There is no ambiguity about what I'm saying. And that, that took a long time to figure out. And, and so that's when you breathe um, um, spore or mold fragment in, in a moldy building, there's a particular receptor in your lungs called the Dectin receptor and it's being lit up like the proverbial Christmas tree. Um, uh, and that, that's really important. Another thing is that fungi actually have more um, chromosomes and genes than we do. Um, and that is that um, they make proteins that are a little bit too similar to ours. Uh, and so the body sees them after they're, they come into your body through uh, special cells in your lungs. Um, and it says, oh, my God, what's going on here? And it also causes uh, an inflammatory sequence that's a bit chaotic. Um, and, uh, and then um, uh, lastly, uh, but no means leastly, the structural, like if you like the cement of a fungal cell wall is made of a fungal chitin, it breaks into little pieces and that also causes problems in our lungs, um, just like bits of uh, cockroach chitin, which is different chemically, also cause this same inflammatory effect. So the fungi that occur in buildings 
um, are in some important respects biochemically different than the ones that occur in outdoor air. And that, that also was pivotal to coming to uh, um, recognition that, you know, mold and dampness is, is um, you know, those signals we see in epidemiology are real, and here's why. And you mentioned earlier, and, and you've looked at mycotoxin all your life. Yes. Uh, you didn't mention it in that re, that little discussion yeah. we just had right there. Is does it play a role at all? Do you think, or is it yeah. something? So that, under normal circumstances, the ants. So I mean, just think about it this way: um, if you're exposed to formaldehyde, which is a, is a human carcinogen, but it takes enormous concentrations of exposure to cause cancer in humans. Okay. Um, and you're also exposed to aflatoxin, the fungal toxin aflatoxin, which is by far, by tens of thousands of times, the most potent human carcinogen that we're regularly exposed to, not us in North America, but in developing countries mainly. Um, uh, which one is going to kill you? The one that's not very <laughs> potent right. yeah, or the right. one that's so potent it's, right. you know, right. from here to Pluto kind of thing by comparison. So so there, there were two problems, and I think this is mostly gone today. The first problem is that in that enthusiast community, people would bring claims of finding toxins that are only found on food. Absolutely, for sure, only found on food. Um and, uh, and there's a whole bad litany about that. So the one thing that I, I, I said, okay, well, fine. If it's true, we need to know. So I spent a huge amount of money to basically study the actual secondary metabolites or the low molecular weight compounds that fungi make of the type that grow in buildings. Um, and so we produced a, a pretty big array of those compounds that actually are produced by fungi that basically only three or four labs on the planet can analyze, which is another thing, right? Um, and, uh, and many of them were not known. I would say most of them were not known, low molecular weight compounds. So then we made the decision to test them in um, relevant animal models, in mice, uh, rats, and, and then ultimately in systems that uh, build off those the, uh, cell lines and primary cells and so on. And, and so the way you need to think about it is that they're there, the relevant compounds from buildings. But um, under normal circumstances, their impact is so much lower <laughs> than the impact of the glucan, the fungal proteins and the fungal chitin that they don't play, it doesn't matter because you can only kill a cell once. I see, okay. Before but but we, it uh, is always important to remember that in the early days, and there's a few people I see have joined who will remember this, that very often we would get, you know, I would meet people at AIHA or ASHRAE meetings big, you know, strong construction guys come in and they say, Doc, I was remediating, you know, fungus and I feel can't work anymore. Um, and, um, and so there was a period before people, you know, wore appropriate personal protection when, when doing that kind of work. And there you can get very high exposures. And under some circumstances, albeit today, I would say unknown, you might get enough of exposure to, um, to um, um, you know, to, to cause the toxin to become important if for your health. Let's go to the roundup. The roundup is brought to you by April Air providing healthy humidity, ventilation, and air purity solutions for new and existing homes. April Air, healthy air, healthy home at aprilaire.com. I could do this all afternoon. Cliff, is there anything you wanted to jump in on? Well, no, no. I, I was thinking uh, 
you know, I think what we should do is just get through the questions if we could. Well, at least some the of them. Is, um, some right. of them we may want to address in afterthoughts. I'll send an email to Dr. Miller, but um, this one that just came in, I thought was very interesting. Should IAQ investigators measure airborne fungal glucans? Yeah, that's a very good question. Thank you for that. Um, in the pending ACJH uh, by, uh, revision to the bioaerosols guide, there's a, uh, a lot of uh, material about fungal glucan. And now that you're all experts, you know why. Um, and it's, it's been the view of researchers that probably someday that uh, will need to be done um, and will be useful. So in research studies, um, housing and health studies, fungal glucan is an extraordinarily useful measure of fungal exposure for the reasons I've explained. Um, and in fact, um, recently we published a big uh, compendium of all the biocontaminant data from many of the housing and health studies done in Canada uh, in indoor air. It's open access so you can find it. So you can see a bit more about that. Um, and it's been thought for quite a long time that once we fully understood that and resolved the methods of measuring that uh, fungal glucan will be, um, will be uh, uh, you know, important. All right. And you, you mentioned that you saw, were there any other questions you wanted to answer now, or do you want me to send you an email and then I can? Oh, no, put them it's up, up to you. I, I, All right. Then what I'd like to do is this. I want to first say how powerful I think it has been and important when you are trying to affect change, how you got involved with industry organizations like the ACGIH and AIHA and how much time I know you volunteered on those committees. But I think that is also what makes what you have done over the years so powerful. Well, I have, I, was invited to AIHA in 1991 to talk about what we were doing in Canada. And I mean, you know that I mainly work in a laboratory in my office and I have students and postdocs and colleagues. Um, but I wanted to fully understand what questions industrial hygienists had, what engineers they had, because that's the question I'd rather answer than what my question would be. Um, and, and the other thing I say about that is that I know what to do, uh, you know, when about these things and over the years, but it wouldn't be me doing it. So if I don't communicate that in a way that makes sense for industrial hygienists or uh, engineers, it won't get done. So, so it was really important for me both to get the questions right and to make sure that whatever I guidance I offered or helped to write, that they made sense to the community I needed to deliver that for, for the benefit of public health. I've got one more before we go. What's the future of indoor environmental quality look like to you? Yeah. Well... <laughs> It's funny you say that because I've just finished another big assignment for Sherry Marsham and, and Jack Springston that I didn't completely volunteer for. Uh, <laughs> and, and it's caused me in a way to think about that question. And I think the answer is um, um, uh, look at we're in COVID or trying to come out of COVID. And the question is, is about you know, virus transmission in buildings. And a lot of the things that we've done to, again, save energy have actually been not helpful <laughs> to limit virus transmission in buildings. So I think we're going to have to have a big think about that. Um, related to that, um, as Jack Springsteen would know better than me, we see more Legionnaires disease, including in Canada, than we ever did. And part of it is climate. Um, but uh, uh, and non-TB mycobacteria, but part of it is that green buildings use less water, so the pipes warm up and stuff happens, right? So mm -hmm. I don't know what the future is, but I know that 
that we have for the third time in my career created their problem. And then we're trying to wrestle with a problem that probably won't go away ever. And that is the movement of, of new viruses around the planet. Very interesting. Before we go, is there anything we missed that you'd like to add? Well, it, it's your show. And, I, you know, I like you guys. So when you asked, I said, as long as you don't say legend, <laughs> okay, I'll, <laughs> I'll, 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 uh, I'll participate. Well, we truly appreciate your, you've been a great friend to the show over the years. And uh, I, I was looking forward to this show and I'm glad we were able to pull it together. And I just want to say thanks again for joining us. And for those of you that did not get your questions answered, I will send an email out to uh, Dr. Miller there and we'll put it in the afterthoughts.iaqradio.com site. And uh, looking forward to talking again in the future. I know you also said you're not done yet. No, I said I'm not dead yet. <laughs> anyway, yeah, no, thank you for your interest in this field. All right. Well, thank right. you, Dr. J. David Miller. It's always wonderful to talk. We've got a lot of other great shows lined up for the rest of the year. So please come back and join us next Friday for the next live episode of IAQ Radio Plus. For IAQ Radio, I'm Spike Reel saying thanks for listening. <laughs>